Good morning. How are we? Uh, we are, uh, want to welcome you to the Great Hall. Obviously, you've been worshiping with us. want to welcome those who are uh, streaming both our Great Hall service and our sanctuary service. You're joining us as well here uh, in the Great Hall. And it's good uh, to be together. It's good to be back in this room. I feel like it's been a while for me. Uh, so it's good to be with all of you. Uh, been working through a series that we're calling Paradox and, and this idea that, that Christ will call us to live in a way that often runs counter to the way in which the culture around us asks us to live. Now, again, culture is not bad. It's not good. We're a part of culture, so we're a part of what makes it what it is. Uh, so if you're not happy with it, we're also a part of it. If you're happy with it, you're a part of it. Congratulations. And uh, what, what culture is, is it desires conformity. It wants us to go alongside of what, what the, the dominant stream is, is doing. And so when we are uh, uh, called by Christ to live in a different way, it creates this tension. It sometimes results in persecution and other things like that. But for the most part, for us, it, 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 it deals with tension. And so this week we're talking about uh, uh, arrogance, uh, sorry, humility, excuse me, in an age of arrogance. We live in an arrogant society. We live in an arrogant culture. We live in a self-aggrandizing culture, a, a, a people that, that like to say, look at me, look what I've accomplished, and look what I've done. And if not, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished. We work really hard to hide the things that we failed at, which is another sign of arrogance. Right? We don't like to be transparent. We don't want people to see who we are. Our social media feed is full of success. It's not full of failure. right? And so this week as I was uh, looking through this, uh, there's a, a part in the, the text we'll read today in 1 Timothy 6 uh, where it says that, that uh, what's the root of evil, right? And we all know money, love of money is the root of evil. We'll get there. Uh, but that got me thinking about trees. And so I started looking for examples of trees in literature, mythology, stuff like that, that would be bad, like evil trees. And, and there's not really a tree that's seen as evil. Uh, in fact, most of the time, trees are like an image for, for good things, growth, nourishment. But where you find evil is not in a tree, but in literature, you find it in things like a forest or in the woods. And you see it in a bunch of different stories, right? So in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy and the crew, they're attacked by trees. Those trees are angry for some reason. I don't know. It's, it's Oz. I don't know. And they're attacked by trees. They go into the forest. It's dark and it's scary and they're attacked there. Hansel and Gretel, they go into the woods. They're led there, I think, by their parents, which is just a weird story. You start discovering when you have kids how weird your, your stories were as a kid. You're like, why did we read this? So Hansel and Gretel are going into the forest and, and they're left there in the woods and they find the evil witch that tries to eat them. Again, our children are reading these. Even in Lord of the Rings, in The Hobbit, right? They go into Mirkwood, right? In The Hobbit. Yeah, I'm flying that flag. I don't care. <laughs> they go into Mirkwood. They're attacked by spiders. And then in the books, not in the movies, Frodo and the gang are, are attacked in the old forest by old man Willow, rescued by Tom Bombadil. I don't care. I, I can do this all day. <laughs> Forests, trees can be incredibly scary. So when people are arrogant, when people are self-centered, we kind of grow this massive oak, this tall, tall tree of self-aggrandizement and self pride in our life in front of everybody. And a single tree like that, eh, not a big deal. One arrogant person, okay, cool. But when you have a culture like that, it turns into this deep, dark forest that we all kind of get lost in, all self-promotion, all focused on building our brand, all focused on, on me, 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 me. And it becomes this dark, deep wood that becomes difficult to navigate. And so today I want to talk about how we can get out of this forest. How can we find our way through? Again, 1 Timothy 6, uh, and I'll read the entire passage uh, right now, starting in uh, the tail end of verse 2. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He is an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels without word, about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Skip to verse 17. 
As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So let's talk about arrogance today. Let's talk about what it looks like, what are the signs of arrogance, what's the source of it, where do we get it from, and then what are we going to do about it? Signs of arrogance, starting in verse 2. Paul's back to his primary problem in Ephesus, which is false teachers. False teachers that are not lining up with what uh, Jesus and the apostles have taught. Look back at verse 2. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, and then he's about to go on. Being in line, right thinking about who Jesus is, correct doctrine will lead to right living. When you believe right things about who Christ is, that will transform you, right? It tells us in Romans 12. We're transformed by what? The renewing of our minds. If you have an improper view of who Jesus is, you will have an improper walk in your life. If Jesus is not accurate, now again, there's grace, right? There's grace for that. There's, every single one of us probably isn't 100% right on everything about Jesus Christ. But we seek him, and we seek to line up with what he taught and what the apostles have handed down through his word. And what happens is, when we are, are, are lost, when we don't understand who Jesus really is, it manifests itself in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that Paul talks about here is it manifests itself in arrogance. It's arrogance. And there's signs of arrogance. There's things that, that appear in a person's life. If you want to know if you're arrogant, examine yourself. Based on what the passage says, look at verse 4. He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. You're shallow. If you're arrogant, you're shallow. Trees have a, a tendency, right? They, they grow roots. But some trees uh, don't grow their roots deep enough. And they grow large. They grow tall. They grow broad. But then what happens when a strong wind comes by? Tree gets pulled down, gets knocked over, falls on your house. And then you have a tree house. And it's cool. It's not cool. Some of us, as followers of Christ, we become shallow. The depth of our relationship with him is not deep at all. And this is what's happening in Ephesus. These teachers are coming up. They don't have a, a strong relationship with Christ. They haven't been pursuing him very long. They've not submitted to uh, the leadership of other people. They've wanted to take positions of power and authority for themselves. And they're shallow. They're not lining up with sound doctrine, sound teaching. They don't understand truth. They don't understand grace. Maybe they're legalistic. And so it creates these false teachings. And it creates a kind of spiritual narcissism. When you aren't deep spiritually, it will create a situation where you will constantly take and take and take. You're a consumer Christian. Because that's all you can be. Because you don't have anything to offer. The rest of the body. Now, you might say, well, Travis, like, what, what, do I, what do I do about that? Look, every single one of us is not as deep in Christ as we want to be. We're not deep enough in our, in our relationship with him. It's only grow in him. The difference between the arrogant, shallow Christian and the not arrogant, shallow Christian is this one knows they don't know anything. This one is willing to, to say, I, I need to grow. I'm not where I want to be. I've got things in my life I'm not proud of. I'm, I've got sin in my life. I need to, to turn and repent. I need, I need to, to grow deeper. I need to be in a relationship uh, with Christ. I need to be in a relationship with other people growing in Christ. This person over here, you can't correct them, which leads us to the, the next point, point. Shallow, and then they become argumentative. Look at verse uh, 4 again. He has an unhealthy con craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Arrogance begins to grow in a person's life, and they start to look argumentative. They start to look uh, like the opposite of what Christ has called us to live like. This person's not stirring up anything good. Their contribution is actually negative, and it tells us in the passage, it tells us envy is a part of what they give. They see what other people have, and they're jealous. They want more of it. So they're envious. They're slander. They use their words to harm and not build up, right? So if I want to look really tall and really big and impressive, 
I go hang out in the preschool department. <laughs> They're all shorter than me. I'm like Shaq in there. It's awesome. If I want to look big and tall, though, in front of other people, in my life, in my successes, I put other people down. I cut other people down. I use my words to tear down, not to build up, right? And then there's evil suspicions. It talks about those evil suspicions. What are those? Those are when any time somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've noticed there's, there's this thing in your life. Or, hey, I've got some concerns about the way you're following. Like, I've got, you think that they're wrong. You're defensive. You struggle to hear any sort of criticism. Any, and you, you've got the market cornered on truth and right thinking. And if anybody challenges you, well, then you get defensive. You get argumentative. And the reason this is the case is because you're puffed up. You're shallow. And because you're puffed up and shallow, we're all afraid of being found out for what we really are. And so what we do is we create controversy, throw people off the scent. If I can stir up a little trouble, get people distracted, then they won't pay attention to the things that are going on. Speaking from experience, insecure, anxious people are irritable people. If you're an irritable person, you might want to look at whether or not you're really secure in Christ, in yourself. And then a fully-fledged, arrogant tree in your life is, is a greedy tree. Look at back at verse uh, 5. Deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. The fully mature, arrogant person, sounds a contradiction to say that, is going to ask one question whenever anything happens in their life. No matter what takes place, their number one initial reflex reaction will be this. How does this affect me? How does this impact my life? How does this challenge my goals and my desires? How does this ruin my chances for getting what I want? How does this negatively impact me? How does this positively impact me? Godliness is not a means of gain. So godliness should be about who? Hint, it's the first three letters of the word. It's God. But we think sometimes that if we look right, if we act right, if we look spiritual, then we can get something out of it. It's a means of gain, and it becomes about us. Worship should be about Christ, not about us. Unfortunately, what's happened is the more we look at the story of the gospel, the more we look at this story that, that we were created by a God that loves us and that we sinned, we fell away from him as a people. But he didn't give up on us. He sent his son to die for us. And that he's returning one day to, to set everything to rights. This story, what we did is we twisted it and answered one question. How is this about me? What do I get out of this? It's where you get the health and wealth gospel. It's where you get prosperity gospel. It's where you get this idea that has pervaded Baptist churches for a long time. If I get saved, if I get baptized, then I'm good. I'm out of hell, so it doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want now. That's what I get out of it. I get out of my hell free card. I'm good to go. It's not what the gospel's about. It's not what the gospel teaches. And I think the reason why all this slips past our attention is because we have a misunderstanding of what greed is. A lot of us think greed is about money. Money, it's not about money. It's about more. It's about more. I want more, right? More food, more time, more praise, more affirmation, more technology, more promotions, more, more, more. And they'll do whatever it takes to get it. And when arrogance and greed function like this together, and you have a person who's just asking, how does this affect me? How does this affect me? You know what happens? You don't stop, you don't, uh, you're not bothered by that thought. You're like, oh, yeah, I ask that question all the time. In fact, it doesn't feel wrong. It starts to feel right that you should process things through who you are and how it affects you. Godliness is not a means of more. Paul tells us, though, what it is a means of. Verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Paul's making a very subtle implication here about uh, that I didn't realize until I read it uh, somewhere. I can't take credit for this. I think it's Robert Yarborough uh, that, that brought it up. Um, commentary that I was reading. There's a philosophical idea here. And it's presented in the idea that we can't bring anything into the world. We can't take anything out. So you are a, a, a created person, yes. You have a starting point. But from that point on, you will go on and on. Much like Celine Dion tells us, on and on. You're going to go on and on. That was a really dated reference. I'm proud of you all for getting that. 
you're going to go on. You're an eternal being. Now, you're not eternal like God's eternal. God has no beginning, no ending. But you have a start. You were born into this world. You aren't pre-existent. But you will live forever. And you will either live, if you have a relationship with Christ, if you've accepted and put your faith in him, as Rhett talked about when he was being baptized, you will live forever with him in this new heaven and new earth that he'll create when he returns. If not, you'll live separated from him. A place that scripture calls hell. That's the way it's presented. And the reason why we are not satisfied, the reason why we're always wanting more, 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 you know why this is? Because as an eternal being, you were not created for temporary things to satisfy you. It's oil and water. They're not meant to be together. It's not meant to, to give you... Now, Paul acknowledges, like, yeah, we need stuff. We need food. We need clothing. Those temporary things, yeah, they, they, they're needed. But have you ever noticed that when you eat a sandwich, there's this really annoying thing that happens. Three hours later, you're like, God, I'm hungry. And then you eat something, and then, like, three hours later, what happens? I'm hungry. You know why? Because a temporary thing, like a sandwich, isn't going to satisfy you. There's a reason why when I wear clothes... If I keep wearing the same set of clothes over and over and over again, they'll eventually break down and wear out. Why? It's a temporary thing. It's not meant to satisfy. The only thing that is eternal that is meant to satisfy you is a relationship with Christ. It's the only thing satisfactory. It's the only thing that we're allowed to be greedy about, to call for more and more and more of Christ. It's interesting. The only thing we're allowed to be greedy about is something eternal. It's interesting. The gospel reminds us that we stand to have great gain in contentment with the temporary and discontentment in the eternal. It's interesting. So where does all this arrogance and greed come from, Travis? What's the source of the arrogance? Let's talk about roots, not the band. Let's talk about roots. Roots are cool things to me uh, because they're, they're different kinds for different trees, right? Some roots in some trees like plunge really deeply into the earth, looking for nutrients, looking for water, uh, and, and sometimes these, these root systems go down deeper than the tree is tall, which is fascinating to me, right? It's like this iceberg in the middle of a forest. Other trees are not quite so deep. They run really wide, right? So they're, they're searching along the ground looking for things. And I think that's live oaks. Live oaks, I think, are like that. Again, not an arborist, so don't correct me. Um, but yeah. But if you're walking in the woods, regardless of what kind of root system we're dealing with, and you're walking in the woods, sometimes you wind up tripping over roots, right? You're going along, you're admiring the birds, they're tweeting, it's like Snow White. It's great. <laughs> Little butterflies landing on your finger, and you're just like, boom, flat on your face, right? And movies make a big deal out of this, right? You, you see it in like horror films, you're running from the bad guy and you're going through the woods and inevitably somebody trips over a root. If I was a bad guy, I'd just wait. Like, All right, I'm just gonna wait for them to trip. It's gonna happen. And that's the idea presented here in verse nine. Look at verse nine. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Notice it's not the root. It's a root of all kinds of evils, including arrogance. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The love of money is a trap. It's a snare. It's a root we trip over. We're going through life. We're going through the woods. And we trip over it constantly, this desire. Now, Travis, you just said that greed was about more, not about money. Well, come on. Money's not about money. Unless you're a coin collector or you're Scrooge McDuck and you like swimming in a bunch of it, nobody collects money because they like money. I want money because of what it can get me. More stuff, more power, more prestige. Money's not about money. Money's gross. Go handle a bunch of dollar bills and tell me your fingers don't just feel. Ugh. Money's gross. We like what it can get us. Unlimited wealth leads to unlimited desire fulfillment. Somebody asks you, hey, if you had X number of dollars, what would you do with it? The response is a variation on this theme, whatever I want to. And it's harmful desires. That's what Paul's talking about here in verse 9. It says they, they, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That plunge is not like the swimmers in the Olympics diving into the water. It's like a ship going under, being plunged into ruin and destruction. Now remember, you might be sitting here thinking to yourself, well, Travis, I, I've seen a lot of wealthy people. I know a lot of wealthy people. They don't seem ruined and destroyed. They seem rather happy. 
Well, I don't think Paul's talking about ruin and destruction in a temporal sense. If we were just talking earlier about can't take anything in, can't take anything out, we're designed for eternity, then the ruin and destruction here cannot be talking about temporal things. It has to be talking about eternal things. Well, Travis, you're saying that rich people can't be believers? No, not at all. But I think Jesus said it was really hard. He says that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich person to, what, enter the kingdom of heaven. You know why I think this is? Because you've got money, you're self-sufficient. I can take care of every need I have out of my, out of my wallet, out of my bank account. I'm self-sufficient. And so it's really hard when Jesus Christ presents himself to you and says, look, I'm all you need for heaven. I'm all you need to have a relationship with God. I'm all you need for life. I'm it. It's hard for a wealthy person to be like, mm, I've been told to diversify my portfolio. You know why I think Jesus is the only way to heaven? You know why I think faith plus works is not salvation? Because it denies the fact that we have to depend solely on Christ. Jesus Christ asks one thing of us, depend on me solely for a relationship with God. Let go of your self-sufficiency, let go of trying to figure it out, let go of trying to put the puzzle pieces together and just follow me. Take the plunge, follow me. And you can trust him. You know why? Notice it says here, pierced with many pangs. We're pierced by the pangs of desire. You know what Jesus was pierced with? Nails, a spear, thorns. He lays down his life for us so that we can let go of these pangs of desire that we have. We can let go of our self-sufficiency. We can let go of our arrogance and follow him with our lives. We can trust him to have a relationship with him. And so love of money becomes this root of this tree of arrogance. And you might sit there and say, well, Travis, you said that greed was at the top of the tree. Now you're saying it's at the bottom. Your metaphors are terrible. They're not. Because I know one thing about trees. I know that trees like to, like every living thing, trees reproduce. And the way that trees reproduce is that in their boughs and their branches, they produce a fruit, a nut, or a cone of some kind, and that drops to the earth. And it gets planted by a, a, a sassy little squirrel or something, and it grows into a mighty tree from there. And it grows and it grows. And The greed that manifests itself in our arrogant trees and our self-sufficient lives drops and it gets planted into the lives of others. And other people see the stuff we have. They see the way we flaunt our wealth in other people's lives and they say, I want that. And that arrogance gets put in their life. And you know the worst, uh, the worst people this happens to? It happens to our kids. We teach our kids this. And it's inadvertent because we, we want what's best for them. I want what's best for my girls. I will reach out and take anything I can to give them the best opportunity. But am I teaching them the way of Christ? Am I teaching them to take and satisfy yourself? Or am I take, teaching them to taste and see that the Lord is good and that he's all you need? What am I teaching them? Because if I have not dealt with my own struggles with arrogance, my own struggles with greed, my own struggles with self-sufficiency, I'm just gonna teach my girls to do the exact same thing that I do. They will be disciples of self and not disciples of Christ. And the forest of arrogance gets deeper and darker and broader because more trees are planted every day. Travis, this is an uplifting time you're giving us here. What do we do with this? Well, let's talk about the slaying of arrogance. Let's talk about the slaying. Paul skips down a little bit. Verse 17, he says, as for the rich in this present age. Now, we gotta stop here, unfortunately. Because I have a tendency, and you probably have a tendency as well. When you read, come across scripture and you, you see it says uh, the rich, you, you tend to exclude yourself. Because I'm not a billionaire. I'm not running the space race twins, Bezos and Branson. I'm not evacuating the planet. Does that make anybody else uncomfortable that like all the billionaires are leaving? It's like, what do they know that I don't? So the average income annually for people in the world is $10,000 a year. Now, whether or not you're young and you don't have a job yet, you're still living with mom and dad, whatever, I guarantee you, you live in a home. In fact, I'm willing to bet $10,000 that 95% of the people in this room, probably that number watching online, make more than $10,000 a year. In fact, I'm willing to wager you make twice, three times, 
four times, five times, six times, 10 times that amount, 20 times that amount. We have this tendency to think that when Jesus is talking about rich people, he's not talking to us. If you are a Westerner and you live in a Western society, he's talking to you. So we need to get real comfortable with the fact that rich people is us, okay? I'm, I'm including myself in this, okay? So what he's about to say is addressed to us as a people. So he's saying, as for us, as for Park City's Baptist Church, in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Now, what does it mean to not be haughty? It doesn't mean just be prideful. Don't be prideful. Haughtiness is looking down on other people. Now, we live in the South, right? And in the South, when we look down on people, we don't actually want them to know we're looking down on them. We smile, we hand them a lemonade, and then we find someone and we're like, did you see what they're wearing? Because that's how we do it down South. In New York, they will tell you to your face exactly how ugly your clothes are. And you can say they're temporal. Jesus is going to close me in righteousness. One of the ways that this manifests itself in our lives is that uh, we are haughty in that we forget people the moment they leave our sight. Out of sight, out of mind. How many of you promise to pray for somebody? Like in the moment, you're like, oh man, that stinks. You've got cancer. I'll pray for you. And then you never think about it again. That's haughtiness. There's this uh, great Saturday Night Live skit. It's called What's That Name? It's a game show. And they bring people onto the game show and they ask them, the first round, they ask them a question like, who's this obscure celebrity? And the people are like, oh, I know this one. And they get like five bucks. And they're like, oh, you were five bucks. And then they bring out the guy's best friend and his girlfriend of four years. And they're like, we'll give you $10,000 if you can tell me her name. And he's like, uh, Missy? They bring out his interns. And they're like, these are eight interns that worked for you for nothing for four months. I will give you a million dollars if you can tell me any of their names. He's like, Josh. He's like, there are actually three Joshes in the group. But we do that. Once somebody's out of our sight, we forget about them. How much do you know about your employees? So you might know their names. Do you know their family? Their family names? People that work with you? What about the people sitting next to you in the pew? In the chairs, excuse me, in the great hall. Don't be haughty. Set your hope on God. Verse 17 again. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. I think some of us think, that money is more reliable than God because God's gonna ask me to give up stuff. He wants me to not enjoy the things that I have. He wants me to feel bad about the fact that I'm rich. And as I was talking about the fact that we were rich, you were like, you felt guilty. You were like, oh, here I go, being made feel bad. No, here's the thing. God wants you to enjoy what he's given you. God's blessed you with things to enjoy. God is a God of enjoyment. He made joy. He made pleasure. And this is what's really sinister about uh, uh, greed Greed makes it where you cannot enjoy what you have because you're always thinking about how to get more. I'm not happy with this. I want more. I don't want the, the six-inch sub. I want the foot long. More, more, more. And God says, I want you to enjoy what I've given you. How much or how little? Are you so obsessed with what you don't have that you can't enjoy what you do have? That's greed. So set your hope on God. And let him fulfill you. Then do good, verse 18. There to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Basically, do good and give out of what you have. We all have an abundance of things, whether it's money or time or energy. What are you going to give? What are you going to give from? Put it towards other people. Spend it on other people. And yes, you're supposed to enjoy it. But part of that enjoyment is blessing other people with it. And the last verse, verse 19, we need to lay hold of life. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may lay, take hold of that which is truly life. This is the part where we really learn how to get out of this forest that we're in. Because the uh, truth of the matter is, if you want to lay hold of life, you have to do something really counterintuitive. You have to die. You have to die if you're going to lay hold of life. You have to die to yourself. We're sitting here being like, oh, we got to cut our way out of this, this forest of arrogance. I got to take the ax to some of my friend's egos. I'm going to cut them down. No. You start with your own ego. You start with your own tree. You start with your own tree of pride and greed. And you lay yourself down. And that's the way to life. And you know how I know that? Because I'm going to tell you a story about another forest. 
It's not really a forest. It's like a grove of trees. And it was just outside of a city. And these are weird trees. They had no roots. They had no leaves. And on these three trees hung three men. And in the middle was the creator of the universe, pierced for our transgressions. Telling us the only way to have life is to die. And he gave us life by dying for us. The only way out of the forest is to die. The only way around our pride and our arrogance is to cut it down, to take the ax to our own tree. And it's really hard to do. You can't do it on your own. You can't get out of your own way. That's why you need Christ. You need Christ to come and help you with it. You need Christ to come and show you the way out. You need Christ to forgive you for all this massive tree that you've let grown up in your life that we've implanted in, the, in other people's lives and hearts. And then once you're done with that, you've got this big old log laying in the middle of your life. Well, Travis, what am I supposed to do with the remains of, of my identity and who I am? You know, we do the same thing we do with every tree that we cut down. We take it to a carpenter. You take it to the carpenter. And he's going to take it and he's going to make it into something you can use. And I guarantee you that log of your pride and your arrogance is going to get made into the same tree that he was crucified on. And this is what he means when he tells us to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. The denying of yourself is cutting down your own pride and your own arrogance. Taking up your cross is giving it to him and saying, what are you gonna do with my life, Lord? And then once he's finished making it, as he's working on it, really, you follow him out of the woods. And that's the way out. That's the way we get out of this wooded, nasty, deep, dark forest of pride and arrogance. And that's the paradox, really, is that the only way to have life is to die. You all know what, the, what pride and arrogance looks like in your life. I don't have to tell you that. The Holy Spirit will show you that. My hope and my encouragement for you is that you would trust the carpenter to make out of your life and out of your identity, out of your pride, out of your self-worth into something God-glorifying that he can use. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, as a church, as a people, as a wealthy people, we offer you ourselves. We offer you our resources. And Lord, I pray that we would not find our pride and our arrogance in what we possess. And I pray that you would make us greedy for you and not for things. Lord God, lay the ax to our trunk. Give us grace with one another and make us all more and more into your image. That's in your name we pray.